the panelists to come, Mr. Bupi, Mr. Leica, Mr. Bingra, Mrs. Patricia Stavich, Mr. Schneider, please. Well, I think that we can start while technical issues are continue to be solved. So again, good morning. We will now start with the work after those introductory speeches and of course after yesterday's discussion of the young people dealing in the research of the security and giving us some different type of insight into the issue. We will follow the suit of uh, these greetings of this morning. Actually, we will follow uh, some of the ideas and thoughts of the Prime Minister, Mr. Dacic, regarding the Balkan being, the, in the security terms, a success story. Are we or aren't we not? Um, uh, that will, of course, be part of each and every discussion during this two-day, three-day conference, actually. But we will have here this morning uh, uh, an interesting group of people, not only diplomats, but also practitioners and researchers uh, very well knowing the situation in the Balkans. So let me give you the opportunity to introduce with a few words uh, each and every of them. I will start with uh, Mr. Lajčak, Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Slovak government. As Sonia has said this morning, he is somebody that the region knows very well, and he knows the region very well. He served as a diplomat, but also he served as a special representative of the uh, high representative of the European Union for Foreign and Security Policy back in 2006, and uh, again Bosnia. But nevertheless, he is still dealing with politics uh, of the Balkans, following it very closely. Uh, so, welcome to Belgrade again. Thank you. Um, the next to Mr. Lajcik is a deputy prime minister, the first deputy prime minister of the Serbian government and the minister of defense, Mr. Aleksandar Vucic. Mr. Vucic also holds uh, several other uh, very important posts within the Serbian government. He is uh, the secretary general of the uh, Council, National Council for the Security, coordinator of the team for the fight against organized crime and corruption, as well as the coordinator of the um, um, services of the agencies uh, here in Serbia. Uh, for a long time, Mr. Vucic is uh, in politics since 90s. Uh, he was part of the government back in 98 to 2000. He is a lawyer by education. And uh, thank you very much for being here with us to give us your insight from all of those positions regarding the uh, um, Balkans uh, today and tomorrow. But I won't correct you now. Please correct me. No, correct me if I made a mistake. That. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jerzy Schneider is coming from Czech Republic. Uh, again, Deputy uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, uh, for some long time, researcher within the Prague Institute uh, for the International Security Studies. Uh, but uh, this very important part of his work is uh, uh, dealing, uh, dealing with the issues which are uh, closely uh, connected with uh, international politics and the international security for which he was uh, not only practitioner but also researcher for a long time, uh, working within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, doing the project manage management and analysis. Again, welcome to Belgrade. Um, one of the uh, tough ladies from the Balkans, and assets <laughs> from the Balkan, uh, Mrs. Anna Trisic Babic, she is coming uh, from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. She is a uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, for a long time now, but the most important and most recent post that she holds is a uh, post of the coordinator of the team for uh, NATO integration. Um, which is uh, one of the, maybe the most interesting things um, uh, that we are going to discuss today, the Euro-Atlantic integration of some of the countries of the region. Mrs. Trishic Babic also uh, has the experience working uh, with the NGO sector, but also working at the cabinet of the Prime Minister of Republika Srpska within the Republika Srpska. Again, welcome, Anna, to Belgrade. 
And last, of course, not least, somebody who is also very known here in the region, uh, Ambassador Theodor Winkler. Uh, Ambassador is coming from the DECAF, uh, Geneva Center for the Democratic Control of the Armed Forces, and he has been the director of the DECAF since 2000, if I'm not wrong. Uh, very long experience dealing in the uh, security issues uh, department uh, of the defense of the uh, Swiss government. Again, welcome to Belgrade. And um, uh, if you don't mind, I will propose you to discuss around three uh, big parts uh, of the paradigm, the new security paradigm in the Balkans. Uh, the regional cooperation as such, European, European uh, Euro-Atlantic integration, and last but definitely not the la last important, the issue of the impact of the crisis uh, on the re region and on the developments in the region. So let me start with Mr. Lajcek. Uh, can you give us um, some of your thoughts or share with us some of your thoughts regarding the past, present, and future uh, of the regional cooperation in the Balkans? Do we have something new to offer? And can we now consider balkanization to be a positive term? Please, Mr. Plejcik. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back in Belgrade. It's always a pleasure, and it's always interesting to be back. And uh, I'd like to start by answering an easier question about success, to which I can give an affirmative yes, which is the question about the Belgrade Security Forum. This definitely is a success. And it's incredible that it's in its second year only it has turned into a valuable platform for discussions about the all aspects of security policies, bringing uh, together distinguished experts and generating ideas which are relevant not only, on, not only for this region but also beyond. Congratulations. Now coming to the topic, I, I'll, be, I'll try to be more philosophical uh, to set the framework for our <laughs> discussion. And I have to start by saying that I don't feel comfortable with the word final, because there is no final uh, success, there is no definite state of affairs, and even a success requires hard work. Even success has to be not only achieved, but then defended, protected, uh, and maintained. So there will never be a moment when we can say, we made it, now we can lean back and relax. So uh, su success is a process as well. Now. When we try to answer the question whether the Balkans is a success or not, I would say that the answer depends on the level of our ambitions. Uh, is there a progress in terms of the political, economic systems, in terms of uh, regional cooperation? Definitely yes. Does it mean that we have achieved our ultimate goals when it comes to the European and Euro-Atlantic integration? And the answer is no. There is certainly no time for complacency we can say that the situation is good, but it's not good enough. We are not where we want to be. And this, is, this should be probably the point of departure uh, also for, for our discussions. Not to spend too much time bragging about what has been achieved, but rather discussing about how to complete our journey. And here the most important word is reforms. The success for the, for the region of the Balkans by, by, will be measured by the membership of all the countries of this region in the European Union and by the membership of all those who so wish in the NATO. In order to get there, we need to work hard, we need to work every day, we need to work patiently. What I suggest you to do is to be able to come to Brussels and to say, we have made this or that reform, we have adjusted this or that piece of legislation, we have implemented this or that measure, and all the purpose of all these steps and all these measures is to bring our countries closer to the European Union. It will not work the other way around. European Union uh, or NATO are not going to soften its criteria. On the contrary, as you see and as we all know, European Union is going through its own internal challenges and through its own uh, reform processes. So the European Union you will be joining will be different from the European Union we know nowadays. And we still must not forget that the membership of the countries of the Balkans in the European Union is not a gift. It's something that should make European Union functioning even better, that should make the EU stronger and more efficient. We must not forget this. 
But the system works, and we, we've seen it, and we see it in, uh, on the example of Croatia or Montenegro. Why these countries are successful? Because first they have set the priorities right. They have defined the European integration as the number one priority. They manage to look forward rather than backwards, and they manage to turn their goals into reality, not by words, but by deeds. And they manage to convince the members, all the members of the European Union, that they are serious. And the same goes for NATO. We have Albania and Croatia, which are in NATO. The processes, the technicalities are different, but the principles are the same, and the sets of values on which the European Union and NATO are built are the same. It will not help to complain that the European Union is not fair or the EU should do more for the region. We have to accept the reality that this is a complex process, uh, that uh, it's becoming even more complex than before, that the acquis are more complex and, and longer, they are more complicated. Uh, we have to admit that the European Union has become a moving target in a way, not because this is what the EU wants, but because uh, European Union is going through its own integration and it's redefining its structures and the way it functions. But uh, still, we, we shall not forget, and I'm 100% convinced about the fact that there is no better perspective, no more positive perspective for the region of the Balkans than to become part of the European Union and part of the NATO, for, as I said, for all those who so wish. And for this, I do think that we have proper procedures and we have uh, rules that should be respected. We don't need to change them. The second word uh, besides the reforms I want to stress is the word conditionality. Conditionality is very important, is, is the key word here. As a matter of fact, uh, we apply conditionality even within the European Union because now if you want to, to get the financial assistance from European Stability Mechanism, you have to fulfill uh, certain criteria. If you want European Central Bank to buy your bonds, you have to meet certain criteria, certain conditions. So conditionality is here, and we have to insist on conditions. To make any discounts, any shortcuts, will, will help neither the aspirant countries nor the Euro European Union. Therefore, we should not be obsessed with the status. We shall not focus too much on dates. We have to concentrate on substance. We have to generate solutions rather than questions or requests or demands. We have to build the European reality in our countries. And I think this is the crucial point which I keep repeating. It's not about coming to the European Union. It's about building the European Union in our countries, building the European standards, the way the political system, economic system functions, the way the human rights are protected and so on and so forth. And, 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 and this is what, the, what is the substance of the, of the European integration process. Of course, EU is here to help, to assist, but cannot do the, the, the work for, for you, for each of you. Now, in the meantime, it's our job uh, in the European Union, in the NATO, to support you, uh, to make sure that the enlargement perspective, the, your membership perspective is alive. And I can assure you that this is the case. There is a strong group of supporters of the, of the enlargement, and uh, even those who might not be enthusiastic about the enlargement are respecting the rules. European Union is, is uh, very serious and solid and, and honors its commitments. You are still lucky because you have a vision, you have a perspective, and there are countries who would die to get the same perspective. Uh, a vision has been offered to the region of the Balkans, uh, a vision to become part of Europe, part of Europe which is united, which is peaceful, which is democratic, which respects human rights, which respects the dignity of each individual, which is able to cooperate, which is able to secure the needs of its citizens, and which is competitive on the global stage, and which is prosperous. So uh, if I wanted to be poetic, I would say that there is an empty chair waiting for you at the European table, and this chair will make your voice count. This chair once occupied by you, will make sure that you are no longer on the agenda, but you are setting the agenda. And I would like to wish all of us, all of you, all of us, this vision to turn into reality as soon as possible. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Leitek. It's always uh, um, very good to be reminded that uh, there are certain conditions, a lot of conditions, but also to have in mind the very fact which is uh, important for the region. And that is that for the first time in the history of the region, we have the common goal of each and every of the regional country, and this is the European integration. But let me go back to the issues that we uh, would like to explore more during that forum. And I would like to ask Minister Vucic regarding that. Does the pace in the European integration process jeopardize, or could it jeopardize the European, uh, sorry, the cooperation of the countries of the region? The fact that the Croatia, as we heard, is entering the European Union, can it spoil the whole process of cooperation, especially in terms of the security? Thank you very much, first of all, and I have to say many thanks to the organizers of this forum, of this panel discussion, and to say many thanks to Mr. Leitcher, because what we heard about European enlargement policy was something very good for our years. And uh, I have to say once again many thanks to Mrs. Licht, because she said everything that I think most of the people, most of an ordinary people in Serbia really think about our challenges in near future. And uh, I would say something about uh, regional policy, but also I can't share that view that uh, we are in a kind of jeopardy because Croatia is entering European Union and they won't be so interested or they won't be interested anymore in uh, all security issues. Of course, there are some challenges and I'm sure that uh, with a real cooperation and conversation between all of us, between particularly when I say that I mean Serbia, Bosnia and Croatia, we can solve all the problems. And, uh, but I think, and I would divide it in five sections, we would we would have many problems in various, in various fields and those fields are of course first of all preservation of integrity of Serbia regarding Kosovo issue and uh, I can say that Serbia will do its best to be a part of, of a peaceful Europe and I think that we have already shown our political desire and everything that, that is connected with that to solve all the problems in Kosovo with peaceful means and that's going to be our policy in future as well. Regarding that issue, we, we really support and we really appreciate everything that's been done by K4 and we have a very good cooperation with them. Of course there are some issues that we cannot agree on and that's these are the trainings of uh, Kosovo forces, but anyway, we'll continue our cooperation and I'm sure that it's going to be for the mutual interests, our people and international community as well. Second important issue for us is also fight against organized crime, including anti-terrorist activities, and I think that we have to make a real regional cooperation here and cooperation between our Ministry of Internal Affairs and, of course, all our intelligence services cooperation. And I think that that kind of cooperation is growing day by day and we have a very good, uh, well, that's my assessment, of course, a very good contribution to, uh, with real deeds, not words, as Mr. Lychuk mentioned that, uh, to the regional stability and that's something that will carry on. Uh, the third important issue for us is uh, anti-corruption fight in a sense of terrible economic crisis that we face with today and uh, I think that's, a, that's the field where we can use that word which Mr. Leitchuk emphasized and that is reforms and we are eager to have all kinds of possible help and assistance from all over the world to make a real system and the best possible mechanisms to fight corruption, which 
which is poisoning uh, everything in this country, which is the biggest substantial problem, uh, I would even dare to say, of our economy. Uh, after all, uh, I have to say that fight against poverty in the region is also very important and will face uh, few security challenges if we fight and if we succeed in that kind of a battle. And uh, of course there is something else and which and I can say that we are not successful but we are getting to some point where we would set our priorities and I think that's a good news and I prepare that because uh, only a few sentences and I'll be as brief as it is possible uh, about some agreements that we have already signed and uh, these are examples of security cooperation between Serbia and the EU and I think it's very important for our country to continue with that and uh, it's also very important for us uh, to know that we are the part of the world, we are the part of the region and uh, we need to match our priorities with the priorities of all the others that are surrounding us and with all the others in the prosperous world. The concrete security cooperation between Serbia and the EU has starting with the signing of two important agreements in the field of security and defense policy. Agreement on establishing the framework for the participation of the Republic of Serbia in the EU crisis management operations for and the agreement on security procedures for exchanging and protecting classified information. Both agreements have entered into force on the 1st of August 2012. During 2012, two representatives of the Ministry of Defense and the Serbian Armed Forces took part in the operations of EUTM Somalia and the UNO for Atalanta Somalia. The participation of the Ministry of Defense in the EU missions is an indicator of the political will and readiness of our country and the army to participate in the most complex tasks in confronting contemporary security challenges. I have to say that I think today or tomorrow our parliament will ratify everything that we did with our cooperation with the United Nations on all important issues with multinational, multinational units and our engagement in those units. Our goal is to contribute to the regional, European and global security in close cooperation with our partners from the EU. The Republic of Serbia is committed to building of trust and strengthening the security in the region of the Southeast Europe through exchange of experiences and information. As a full member, Serbia is actively participating in the work of the Defense Ministerial Process, CEE, and this year Serbia has observed a status within the multinational peace force southeastern Europe. Serbia will host a meeting of defense ministers of Serbia in 2013 and the meeting at the level of deputy chiefs of staff Serbia 2014. I would say that uh, Serbia achieves primarily the regional cooperation in the field of security policy Serbia achieves primarily through the Partnership for Peace program and among the activities within this Partnership for Peace program particularly important role belongs to the mechanism of cooperation through IPP plan. This plan presents the level of cooperation with NATO within the Partnership for Peace program which does not prejudge the Alliance membership. You know that we have the decision of our Parliament declaration, resolution of our Parliament that we are military neutral country. The activities, the activities which are undertaken within the development of this plan are in line with our commitment to participate in an active manner in the Partnership for Peace program which is not contrary to the policy of military neutrality of the Republic of Serbia. And after all I have to say that all Western Balkans countries have the interest in creating stable, secure and prosperous region. This is our common goal and we will continue to work persistent, persistently on its accomplishment. And I would say at the end, uh, that of course it's not going to be easy. To preserve stability in the region, but I'm sure that we are in a good way that uh, will secure that path and I'll do my best to assure our partners from international community, first of all, EU member states, 
and all the others that we are fully committed to join European Union, to accept European Union values, and we need your help, we need your real help, we need your real assistance more than ever, although I'm sure that many countries are uh, not even able, but many countries are not ready to help us as they did in the past. I'm sure that we'll get that support, we'll that get, we'll that get help, we'll get that, that assistance, and it would be of the greatest significance for our country, and we hope that we'll meet uh, those things very soon. Thank you very much once again, and sorry that it took so, many time, so, so much time from you. Thanks so Thank much. you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vucic, for sharing with all of us the uh, successes in terms of the security cooperation, especially in the region, uh, and in terms of the cooperation with the, both the EU and the UN, with the standby arrangement, we all wait this document to be ratified in the, uh, in the Assembly. But we will continue discussion of the insights in terms of the cooperation in the region. And I would like to ask Mrs. Trishic Babic to give us um, her thoughts and views, having experience working within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and now focusing on one of the particular aspects of integration process, um, which is not common, as we can hear from uh, Mr. Vucic, for all countries of the region. So now we would like to discuss a little bit about the Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. So what, what actually your team is doing and uh, how do you see that will be both supported and help the regional cooperation? So please. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. And Belgrade Security Forum is something that we really uh, need here in the region. And I do hope and I really do believe that next year this forum even will organize more uh, uh, panels, and, but this is really extraordinary what I, what I saw yesterday and today here. Um, I would shortly also ju just, uh, although I don't like to talk about the, 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 the past and where we were, where are we now, but uh, uh, it's good always to mention where we were 20 years ago, not with our wish, but uh, happened what happened. But in 20 years, really, the whole region passed, let's say, through nightmare, especially the generation who lived in that time. And now I think that we all should be very much satisfied where are we now. I have one sentence, actually two sentences, to, to shortly to describe the situation in the region, including especially my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, with all this peculiar situ situation inside of the country. So if, if you're looking, if you're looking the region in Bosnia and Herzegovina, just taking the photographs every day on the daily basis, the photograph and picture is bad. But if you're looking the region and Bosnia as a movie, that is going on now for 20, 17 years, movie is pretty, pretty good. And of course, it's still not finished. So this is the question now how we will finish finally uh, uh, this story here on the Balkan region. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina has two, two priorities in the foreign policy, that's European Union and euro atlantic integration. Of course, there is a, 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 there, there is a, but this is because of still not understanding that there is the, the very strong position of the Republika Srpska that to be the full member of the NATO Republika Srpska will ask for a referendum. But I will always say we are so, so far from that moment uh, when we will be maybe be able to, to be the full member and really to join the NATO. But the most important thing is that we have, that we have tools in Bosnia and Herzegovina as the Serbia has, first through Partnership for Peace, and now Bosnia and Herzegovina got this map. Map is also one tool working with the, with the NATO, but we are not going through the map, we are going through uh, IPAP, and Bosnia and Herzegovina is already in the third cycle of IPAP. Uh, it's very important to, 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 to do reforms, to be compatible with the NATO, because of all this, uh, as Madame Licht mentioned at the beginning, all these uh, uh, um, challenges that we are facing without even expecting some things what will happen on the daily basis. Uh, I think that the security issue uh, on the Balkan region and why it's very much important that we all have tools with 
either NATO or common European defense, but we need to have because of the European Union, is exactly because of this new threat security. So it's not a question anymore here in the region with us some um, new conventional threats. It's not going to happen here in the region, but we are very, very faced with this having on mind what's happening in the Northern Africa uprising of the uh, Arab Stream. And there is something uh, what I really like to mention very, very often, and there is something that, that, that we will really need to open this story here in our region. It's demography, demography problems that we will be faced. Um, more or less in, 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 in other regions, the, the census has been done, and more or less we all know that we are in terrible minus, minus of here in the region. So demography will uh, influence very much on the security here in the region. So this is something that we should start to talk about this uh, already uh, tomorrow. I, uh, there, there was so much, uh, especially in this year, the, the, the stories uh, and also this uh, uh, comparing European Union is not any more interesting in, in the rest of the region after Croatia is going to join the European Union. Euro Atlantic integration also will stop whatever that means. Uh, but you know, going and really thinking, and to be fair also, it's to say I don't think that this is uh, really such a true. Uh, for example, in 2012, in this year, Serbia got the candidate status. Uh, Montenegro, they got the date for starting the negotiation. And even we in Bosnia and Herzegovina, that we again came in some kind of the trap because of ourselves, the European Commission finds some way, and they offer to us this roadmap that we need, that is going to help us really to move and to be also able to uh, apply. So, uh, of course, because of the Euro crisis and everything that's happening in the Europe and the whole world, and of course that, that no one is talking about our region on the higher level, on the as a political leaders for sure, Merkel and Holland is not talking about us. But we are witnesses that on the level of Minister of Foreign Affairs, every time when they have a meeting, they would mention region, and I think that I'm correct if I'm not correct. Uh, Minister Leitcher can, 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 can say that it's not. But that's, that's also true. So the Europe, the door to us, the Europe and Europe Atlantic integration, they are for sure open. We need to show uh, some more desire. So that's something what, what is here to me, and I think to all of us that we share some views these days, it's a big question, Mark. Does political elite, elite here really want European Union? Is this only will expressing our priorities, European Union, or is this behind this really desire to lead this process, as well as society, the whole society who really need to push this? Um, I think also that we are very lucky to be to be here encircled with European Union countries and. Euro-Atlantic and NATO countries, but we are, where are we now, and we can't change where are we now. We are in the situ situation now where Croatia is the full member of European Union and the NATO. We have our neighboring countries like Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, who is the full member of the NATO. We are here in the middle, and I think that I'm talking now about, and we are talking about 16, 17 millions of citizens. So we all need to find a way first to be inside in the region for 16, 17, 18 millions of citizens as soon as possible to regionally connect in all area and make a common goal, common goal and uh, opportunity to go together uh, more closer towards the, 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 the countries of the European Union. I don't think that... Uh, so maybe coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina and having such a long border with the Croatia, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina has 1,001 kilometer borders with, with Croatia. I don't think that Croatia is going to be destructive or not interested in the, in the region. Croatia is going to be very, very much interested in our region, mainly because of this 1,001 kilometer sharing with Bosnia and Herzegovina that we still haven't identified all where is exactly this border, and because of the Croats who are living in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I think that Croatia is still a very valuable partner, 
And we need also to find a way, and they need, and I think that this is in interest of the Croatia still to work very, very, very closely uh, to the region. In some cases, they show that dedication to the region, you know, giving us uh, translated the key and all other documents. So I would think uh, in this regional uh, cooperation, very much on, on Croatia is a very, very valuable uh, 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 partner. In this situation, where are we now? Uh, where are we, we, we now in the, in the region? I, I think that one of good approach from us and towards us would be uh, regional cooperation through all these regional um, mm -mm, opportunities to organization that we have and that we are part of this, like, like Adriatic Union initiative where you have the European Union countries and where you have us that we are non-European countries, uh, say RCC sets. But I think those who are smaller, European Union and with us non-European Union, this is some very strong connection where we, being together in the project with them, we can uh, even on sectorial approach be very much closer to the European Union without having such a huge political debate what we will finish sooner or, uh, 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 sooner or uh, later. Uh, Personal, I don't like this sentence because everyone is saying we don't have alternative. It's always an alternative, but uh, uh, we do have we do have options here in the region that we, I think, on the forum like this, on the higher level uh, level of the heads of the state, minister of foreign affairs, where we need to to to, to develop what kind of options we do have. Uh, uh, Prime Minister of Serbia, Dacic, mentioned in his speech some Balkan society, Balkan Union. Uh, so this is something that I think in, in very, very near future that we can uh, talk more seriously about this and really uh, be aware, as I mentioned, that we are talking about 16, 17 millions of citizens. Among them you have this young generation, generation that is 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, and that they have the faintest idea when they are listening to us about Yugoslavia, about the past, about the history, they all want the same. They want a good education, they want a secure life, they want to, to, to travel. And uh, just by coincidence, by chance, two days ago I found uh, it was some research about technology. And the Balkan region, our region, is among the last in technology development. So, for example, Bosnia and Herzegovina is 89, Serbia, Macedonia, they are even after Bosnia and Herzegovina. I don't think that uh, we should leave this region like this to our younger generation. They deserve a much better and much more secure uh, regional environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your insight. Mr. Schneider, I would like to continue in that respect to speak about the new security challenges, but also the need. Uh, and of course, your assessment of the regional cooperation within the Balkans, especially having experience in observing of Visegrad cooperation, which is the type that we uh, very often mention as something that we would like to have, not once when we are all in the European Union, but even before that. So, if you'd like to share this with us, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, uh, invited me, and uh, this is a great opportunity. I'm, I'm always uh, um, uh, glad to be back uh, here in Belgrade. Uh, it's, uh, as you said, uh, Visegrad from the uh, uh, regional uh, cooperation models in uh, Europe, I think is probably uh, uh, the best model uh, if, if there is a model. <laughs> and uh, it's closer, uh, uh, I would say, to the region and uh, uh, structurally it's closer uh, uh, than, for example, Baltic or Nordic cooperation or Benelux uh, for that purpose. Uh, so I think it is, it is an interesting exercise, and I know that some researchers, uh, uh, officials are trying to draw some parallels and, and try to, to develop a model uh, uh, from that. Certainly there is a lesson uh, which has to be uh, uh, learned from this. Uh, 
uh, uh, one lesson is that, uh, and we had a, a very heated debate in the 90s, whether uh, Visegrad cooperation is something uh, we want for ourselves or is it imposed from outside uh, simply because uh, EU and NATO want us in a group and not uh, as individual states. And uh, we have learned throughout the years that there is a merit uh, for the cooperation in itself. And I think this is something I would like to, I would like to stress. Uh, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, uh, putting uh, European uh, Union as a, or integration as a priority uh, for the country. Uh, I think what is important is uh, if national priorities and European integration coincide. In that, in that case, uh, the country has an attitude uh, and determination to achieve it. Uh, if the European integration is perceived as something which is not exactly coinciding with the national aspirations of the country, then there is a problem. So it, should be, uh, it, it shouldn't be uh, uh, juxtaposed, uh, uh, national and European aspiration, and that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I had also a trouble, uh, uh, as Minister Lajczak, with uh, uh, the word finally, because I, I don't think we can, we can say uh, there is a final uh, success story. Uh, of course, there is a huge progress, and, uh, and we see the difference, but uh, there will be a never uh, uh, achieved uh, uh, um, something which we can, uh, uh, we can consider as uh, uh, achieved and uh, which cannot backlash or fail. Of course, I have a vision, and uh, I think you all have vision, uh, that the, uh, all Western, country, Western Balkan countries will be uh, stable and prosperous in, in, in future, and uh, uh, we have to uh, cooperate on that. Uh, you raised the question whether uh, 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 this uh, approach, individual approach, and you just mentioned the progress last year, I mean, Croatia, Montenegro, Serbia, all countries have made additional steps. Is it is it uh, uh, good for the uh, regional cooperation or not if countries go on individual tracks? I would argue that if uh, they wouldn't go on individual tracks, it would create regional tensions. But if they go on in individual tracks, and if these tracks are on, on based on merits, the progress is based on merit, then I think it is only conducive to the regional cooperation where the countries can learn from each other's experience and, and uh, assist each other uh, in this. But our main lesson is that Visegrad is not only the tool to achieve, was not a tool to achieve the membership only. But it's, it's, uh, it has its own uh, benefits. Uh, now, uh, let me say something about, before I move to security challenges, you, you, you said, uh, about the crisis and the situation in Europe. I think we have to be aware of uh, uh, not just the, about the economic and financial crisis debate, uh, but uh, uh, about the two aspects. First of all, as Minister Lajšák has, has said, uh, EU is changing, and it's, I understand fully uh, the frustration that uh, you're aiming at the moving target, and it's, it's really frustrating. And believe me, it's frustrating even for the countries which are already in the EU. Uh, uh, some are in the Eurozone, like Slovakia, some are not. I mean, uh, they are differences, and it's, uh, it's, it could be frustrating. Uh, the second point is there is no consensus uh, uh, about the relationship between enlargement and crisis. There are some who believe that uh, uh, crisis is somewhat connected with the enlargement. And there are some, uh, 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 especially from the countries, uh, enlarged countries, but also uh, 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 of other, who acknowledge that without enlargement, the crisis would be deeper. Because enlargement created by enlarging the, the, the common market actually created a cushion uh, for the economies to adapt. And uh, uh, I think uh, we have to be aware about this debate and uh, the debate uh, which 
uh, actually results in positive assessment of enlargement inside the European Union and its benefits for the existing member states hasn't been, I mean, uh, 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 concluded. And uh, your voice is also uh, important and your economic interests uh, are important. Uh, we are talking about transition. Our countries are changing, transforming. We are in transition still. Although we are in the European Union, our country is still in transition. Of course, our politicians will, will say and ha uh, have said already many times that transition has been completed. But uh, 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 don't believe that. We are transforming on a day-by-day -day basis, and we have to adapt, and it is not completed. And transition is something which connects us, and this is something we can, we can share. And that's why we believe that this kind of cooperation, exchange of, in, uh, uh, of experience between Visegrad Group and any form of regional cooperation you will decide here to establish is, is very vital. Our uh, lesson is that we have, uh, you have to put not only your effort into that, but also your resources. And uh, 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 there is the whole new generation of people who uh, have the goals as you described. They would like to have more opportunities. Uh, I see some young people uh, uh, here around. I think this is a challenge for them to create a platform for the regional cooperation uh, which uh, will help the governments uh, to follow on uh, and uh, to establish uh, the, uh, it on the governmental uh, level as well. So that's why uh, uh, we are uh, uh, now uh, debating uh, for already for some time with our Visegrad partners here in the region the idea of uh, why don't you have some fund which is similar like uh, Visegrad fund which is based in Bratislava, not accidentally. Uh, uh, why don't you have uh, something of you, you own? You have you have ownership of it, and uh, it is not imposed from outside. It is not a condition given by by anyone from outside, uh, and uh, uh, which will have a benefit for uh, for the region. And uh, uh, believe me, will be uh, uh, assessed and appreciated very much, very much from outside. Uh, I think this is one of the practical uh, uh, examples what we could do uh, together. Of course, it could, uh, it, it could include uh, the uh, elements which are related to security challenges. It could include the practical cooperation in uh, security sector reform, crisis management, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, and uh, uh, it might create an uh, atmosphere of uh, trust, uh, more trust, which is needed, especially in the security sector uh, uh, among the players in the region. And uh, I, I listened carefully uh, to what the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister said about uh, uh, the regional cooperation. Uh, I think it fits exactly into, uh, into this picture, uh, the cooperation and the uh, uh, building of confidence also in this very important area which brings benefits to uh, the people of the region. So uh, I wouldn't talk about the success story. Uh, Let's together achieve some successes in future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, sharing with us your thoughts regarding the regional cooperation, but uh, also if I may use this position to be host and try to explain the title uh, uh, of this panel. So it's not final, but finally, which means did we reach some level, or can we brag with the level of our achieved cooperation? And then I would like to continue uh, regarding the issue of crisis and the issue of money, uh, which is uh, now the major problem, not only for Europe, but also for the region. And I would like to ask uh, uh, Ambassador Winkler to, sh to give his thoughts regarding the influence of the crisis economic, global economic crisis and the euro crisis, 
uh, on not only the regional cooperation, but also reform process, especially in terms of the security. Well, it's a great pleasure. So not every Swiss is a banker. <laughs> now, uh, ministers, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a joy and a pleasure and a privilege to be able to address in this panel this important forum. Uh, the question is, has progress been achieved? And I think this is undoubtedly the case. If one looks at this region today and compares it to its past, much progress has been achieved. I would also argue that this region is stable. It is surprisingly stable. Given precisely the question uh, that was addressed to me, the problems uh, posed, for instance, by the global economic crisis and particularly by the crisis of the Euro uh, region. Change needs positive incentives. There needs to be a price that is uh, attainable at the end of the road. European integration has encountered many problems uh, in recent uh, years for which it is uh, struggling to find its way. But it has not diminished as a perspective in its political sense and in its security implication and in its overall impact. And I believe this is recognized uh, also here in this region. It might be that things are more difficult, it might be that time uh, may be, more of it may be needed, but the objective of such, I think, shouldn't be changed and cannot be changed because it's the only way forward. And I'm impressed by the ability of the region to withstand, on top of the multiple programs, problems of change, uh, the impact uh, that has been coming to this place through economic uh, challenges. Stability, I think, is here. There is, it is owed in part to the continued presence and attention of the international community, uh, but also, I think, because of the steady progress of reforms in the region. This is recognized. I mean, let's take the example of Serbia. Let me mention just uh, the presidency of the UN General Assembly or the chairmanship in office of the OSCE uh, that is around the corner. DCAF continues to be active in all the countries of the region. There is no reason for us to retire. The job hasn't been done. It will never be done. I share what my predecessors on this rostrum said. Uh, it is a daily uh, work that is going to be with us uh, for a long time to come. Our goal is to support the region in reforming its security institutions and in achieving democratic security sector governance. In so doing, we have developed partnerships with the governments of this region, with parliaments, with the security actors, but also, notably, with civil society actors. Much remains, obviously, to be done. Let me just cite a few priorities as we see them uh, at this juncture. In spite of the first priority, in spite of the multiple uh, pro pro problems, regional cooperation, uh, including among the security sector, particularly I'm uh, inclined to say about uh, among the security sectors, remains crucial. Cooperation is ultimately li closely linked to reconciliation. And reconciliation is a key precondition for stability and security in the region. Cooperation needs, however, also to be practical. International organized crime, illegal migration, uh, fundamentalist tendencies, many things uh, combine with an economic difficult situation to create new challenges. If we look what has been achieved then, uh, in the past, uh, uh, then we are impressed. We saw see regular meetings about uh, security sector officials, police, border police in particular at all levels. We see soldiers uh, training together for peacekeeping operations. 
we see a joint debate and development of the region's security sector in front of an unruly world. This will continue because there are new challenges. Let me just cite cyber as one example. It doesn't stop as a problem at the border of any country, be it in the European Union or not, or on its way, or be it in whatever other situation. Joint action will be needed. And joint uh, pre uh, jo um, thinking about the issue and how to tackle it best is clearly needed. At the same time, I have feelings that regional cooperation still relies too much on external ex incentives. These incentives are important, but I believe that the region itself can and will move stronger to the forefront itself. A second uh, question uh, that I believe needs to be addressed and will continue to be, uh, have to be addressed for a long time to come, in spite of the progress made, is that of corruption. I believe that we all are aware of this continued existence, that we all identify it as a profound problem and we all determined to combat it. Some countries uh, move more swiftly in that respect, others have more difficult uh, pr problems to handle, but there is no way leaving uh, to the future without uh, uh, addressing the issue. The same is applying for organized crime. Wherever uh, problems creep up, uh, organized crime fills the vacuum. The region is also uh, always at risk to become the route for illegal migration, uh, trafficking from other parts of the world, and uh, unruliness in other parts of the world is probably increasing uh, that risk. Much has been done here to fight organized crime. Let me cite as example only the Police Cooperation Convention, of which you are a member, and uh, which is uh, has its secretariat housed at DCAF. I think much has been achieved here. It's now ratified by 10 countries, including several EU members. I believe this is an important aspect. Uh, the gr group will grow in strength and uh, significance. Its implementation will provide police officers with a cooperation toolbox compatible, if not superior, actually, to that of the EU member states. Stronger justice cooperation should in parallel be built to underpin developments in the field of policing, however. Initiatives such as the Serbian proposal to develop a regional arrest warrant are worthwhile and deserve further e uh, exploration. Further need, efforts need to be made to strengthen political independence of law enforcement institutions and the security sector in general. Also, more should be done to build the capacity of law enforcement officials, not only through externally funded programs, but also by improving the region's own training and education systems. Finally, and most importantly, I believe that civil society should be allowed and invited to play a stronger role in the field of security policy in this region. There should be more public dialogue and discussions on security sector reform to ensure that security policy is transparent and addresses the real needs of the public. This is not an exhaustive the few points I made list of priorities. There are many more and not only in the area of security sector. But I hope that you agree that addressing these priorities is crucial for the region's continued transition and increasing stability. Let me close by saying what DCAF contributes to support to the region. We provide advice for the development of strategies and policies to strengthen the democratic governance of the security sector. We continue to facilitate implementation of the police convention. We work closely with border and uh, other police, regular police at the regional level. We work with parliament on the awareness uh, and uh, of them and the, on their oversight function, and we continue to comply to work with the civil sector. 
DCAF is, in short, determined to be a partner of yours. We know that you are in a situation that is not terribly easy. We feel that you work hard to come out of that. And if you need somebody who is helping you in a totally neutral and impartial way, we are happy to fill that job. I think this region can be proud of where it is, so the road remains difficult for all of us, not only in this region. Thank you very much. Yes, I think that we at the region, we are all aware of the role uh, of the DCAF in the reforms, especially in the security process. Now it's time for you to ask questions, have a comment, give your insights. I would uh, like you just to raise your hand uh, and if we can agree on up to three minutes comment and questions uh, in order to have as many questions as it possible. So the first one is over there, Deputy Minister of Defense from Bulgaria, Augustina Tsvetkova. Uh, the microphone over there, first row. Thank you very much. Augustina Tsvetkova, Deputy Defense Minister of Bulgaria, speaking about uh, regional cooperation, I would like to make a short comment. Uh, we should mention one of the most successful uh, initiatives in the region. Uh, this is a uh, Southeast Defense Ministerial Initiative. It was uh, established in the second half of 90s with the support of the United States and Italy. And the main goal of this initiative was uh, the countries of the region to follow their way to Euro-Atlantic integration. I think that this is one of the best examples of a working initiative. And uh, now in the time when NATO speaks about smart defense and European Union speaks about uh, pooling and sharing, we can have uh, one uh, real working initiative. And in the field of defense, it proves that we can work together and we can be valuable for the region. Uh, this uh, initiative uh, already uh, has a Southeast uh, European Brigade. Still the Brigade has only a headquarters, but it's up to us, our efforts, how to develop uh, this uh, initiative. And really, uh, we started uh, only with uh, one uh, country in the region being a member of EU and two countries being uh, members of NATO. Now, the region is different, and uh, this is the way to, to say that uh, it's uh, really uh, a long journey, but the right journey uh, to the success story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question over there. I think that uh, we will comment, but also question get together in order to have the opinion of the panelists. So please. Thank you. My name is Karsten Fries. I work at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, first of all, thanks to the panel for extra, extremely nice and, and good um, interventions. Um, you, you all talked about regional, uh, regional cooperation, which is, which is good, of course. We all support that. But allow me as an academic to ask the more difficult question. Uh, yesterday, we, we in the pre-event, yeah, the academic pre-event, we talked about um, how different countries in the region have different historical remembering, different uh, narratives about the past, the recent past, the breakup of Yugoslavia and the wars. So my question is, if, if all the countries, the people in the countries, in history, in schools, learn different versions of what happened recently, will that, that the high-level regional cooperation among politicians and senior leaders, will that be sufficient if the people of the countries still have conflicting perceptions of what happened in the past? How can they then build a common future? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Milit. I, uh, Milica Uvalic, University of Perugia. I congratulate the whole panel. It was an extremely interesting uh, discussion. Uh, something that was not mentioned uh, in reference to the Visegrad countries uh, and comparing it with the Balkans, of course, regional cooperation is extremely important for the Balkan countries. But uh, EU conditionality 
towards the Western Balkans has been very different with respect to the Visegrad countries. At the time when, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the, Visegrad, well, the Central East European countries uh, declared they wanted uh, to enter the European Union as soon as possible, and there was no uh, strong uh, conditionality regarding their entry into the European Union. For the Western Balkans, on the contrary, uh, there are two additional very important uh, conditions. One regards precisely regional cooperation and the other regards uh, international agreements. Uh, so somehow, of course, the Visegrad uh, agreement and the Visegrad cooperation is extremely useful for the Balkans, but we must forget that the EU policies have been very different and much, much stricter towards the Balkans than towards the Central East European countries. Thank you very much. Um, yes? Hello, my name is Tomasz Zornaczuk. I come from Warsaw, from the Polish Institute of International Affairs. I, uh, if I could direct my question to, uh, to Prime Minister Vucic, we've heard uh, today that uh, Visegrad cooperation that I'm personally interested in for natural reasons uh, was important for those four countries uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, contain this, uh, that are in this uh, group. Do you think, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, that this uh, kind of cooperation would be needed here uh, in the Balkans or this uh, sectoral cooperation among the countries that is existing is uh, sufficient for now. Thank you. Okay, I think that we now have uh, several questions. Uh, first, the issue of the concrete cooperation, like in case of SEDAN, but also don't forget RCC as one of the very important elements of cooperation. Then one of the maybe crucial issues to understand the regional cooperation, is it still an elitistic process or, or it has a deep roots in the cooperation among people uh, of the region? Um, then conditionality, is it different then for the uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe? It's a heavy battle on that. And uh, the last one is direct, uh, directed to Minister Vucic regarding the sectorial cooperation type of the Visegrad Group cooperation. Can it be pursued here within the region? So, uh, except that one, the last one, uh, you are free, or uh, I'm calling you to uh, give the insight of some or each and every of those questions. Mr. Vucic, would you like to start with the direct question? Yes. Uh -huh. Is it work? I have to say that we are very interested in Visegrad Group's work and uh, although it's not the same situation, you know, because yes, there were some disputes, particularly between Slovakia and Hungary, but not such a huge disputes like we had here in, in the Balkan region, you know, between all our countries, particularly countries in former Yugoslavia. And, uh, but yes, the, yes, that's a great experience, and they think that you can protect the interests of all four countries from Visegrad group, group in a much better way than you used to have. And uh, I'm sure that in future we can discuss that issue, but uh, so far we haven't reached any kind of similar agreements in the region. And uh, I can also just add that I completely agree with everything that Mrs. Uvalin, if I remember quite well, I completely agree on everything that she said and about, about things that uh, we would assess, that we would estimate that happened in the past. I would say that all of us have to find a kind of objective approach uh, to everything that happened in the past, but I'm not completely sure whether we'll be able to achieve that in the near future or not because you can just take one example, and that's, let's say, uh, Croatian, uh, Croatian action storm, or, and you'll see completely different views from Croatian and from Serbian, from Serbian side, and no one, no one can, can convince me that uh, someone will be able to overcome that in, in next few years at least. 
But anyway, I hope that we need to discuss all the important issues, not to hide the things uh, under the rug, you know, but to set it out and to sort it out and to solve the problems, to speak about the problems, to speak about the problems openly, uh, to speak with all the arguments, not to hide anything. And I think that after all, we'll get closer to the real truth and I, and I can agree with you that only after that we'll be able to, to achieve a real reconciliation in the region. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lajic, Mr. Schneider, some insight on the conditionality. Is there a difference or are we different? I'll start with the first question uh, about different perception of the past and being a problem eventually for achieving common future. I would say there is no drama in the fact that we might view some historical events differently. And even in, in our part of the world, in Central Europe, which has been part of the same history, you will not find the same interpretation of historical facts in the history books in Poland, in Slovakia, or in Hungary. It's probably only between Czech Republic and Slovakia that we have the same interpretation. Nonetheless, it's, it's no drama provided we understand that history is for historians and the politicians have the responsibility for the future. What is a problem is that if we build a segregation based on history, if we, if we have different communities, different issues, and we don't talk about it, if we have uh, elements like two schools under one roof in Bosnia-Herzegovina. This is the continuation of history which decreases the level of understanding of the citizens of the same country. We have uh, worrying examples of the same model in Macedonia as well. So let's talk about the differences, but we will never achieve the future we want to achieve if we will be looking backwards and if we will be building it on the different interpretation of the history. So try to understand the difference and, and ask the, the professionals to come up with the common interpretation. And that, that's exactly what we are doing with Hungary, for example. Uh, and uh, we have agreed that it's not for the politicians to deal with, with our history, but it's the responsibility of the politicians to make the life of our citizens better. And I think this, this, should, be the, the, this, this should be the approach. With regard to the conditionality, I think I try to address this issue. Yes, it, uh, European Union is an evolving organism, and I, I even said it's, it's a moving target because we are facing the realities and challenges of today's world. Our countries were joining the EU of 15. You are about to join the European Union of 27, 28, and it still has to remain efficient, functional. So obviously uh, the requirements are changing. EU has learned from previous mistakes or uh, learn from the things that were overlooked during the previous uh, rounds of enlargement. And this is still okay. Uh, what is not okay is that if we are trying to use the enlargement process to bring in additional conditions which have nothing to do with European standards. Uh, uh, if we are asking the countries of this region to do something in the name of European integration, knowing that this is not related to uh, to, to the to European key. If we are asking one country to centralize the police and the other country to decentralize the police and, and saying this both in the name of European integration, then of course we are compromising the European idea because you know ex extremely well what is European standards, what is European key and what is not. So uh, we are all living in, in, in the real world. The European Union is uh, trying to get uh, through the, the current uh, problems and, and the crisis stronger than before. And we are honoring our commitments about enlargement, but, but definitely we want to make sure that even the EU of 32, 33 will be equally strong and efficient. So this is how we should understand that. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Schneid, please. First of all, uh, uh, the uh, question of is it elitist or, or people to people? Uh, of course, we have had a various interpretation of Visegrad cooperation insight and uh, in various periods. For some people, it was a tool to get the group into EU and NATO. 
For some, it was a tool of regional, uh, regional cooperation. For some, it was just the uh, free trade area. It started uh, like Central European free trade area. I mean, Visegrad was basically coinciding with that. So, uh, of course, what you put in it, it's there. <laughs> And, uh, and we had uh, uh, various debates about that. But once we established uh, a fund, which is now available for uh, anyone to get grants, uh, then it is shaped by those who ask for grants. And, uh, and it was interesting that there was a demand. So just test it. If there is a demand from the civil society, from teachers, or uh, and this is my bridge to the history... <laughs> Uh, it might be a very interesting project, regional project, uh, uh, a conference of uh, history teachers, for example. But make no mistake, uh, we have our own different interpretations, different narratives, even, I mean, uh, uh, even among Czechs and Slovaks, <laughs> although it's very, very close. And uh, by the way, there was an interesting, interesting exercise. Uh, the Visegrad organized uh, a conference which was called My Hero, Your Enemy which was exactly about this, uh, conflicting perceptions. And, and it's much longer, you know, historical uh, 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 things than uh, uh, relatively recent 20 years uh, uh, war uh, memories. So it's difficult. Of course, we have our own different uh, history narratives with Germans. Uh, of course. Uh, this, is, this is part of it. But what is important is if the poli politics is not shaped by history uh, and it's, it's future-oriented, future uh, that's important. Conditionality, of course, we have a different conditionality at the time. Uh, at the time, uh, Europe, uh, European Union at the time, was really to embrace, was ready to embrace uh, uh, the newcomers, although it took eight years <laughs> From the, from the application to the uh, uh, eight years at a time. Now it's much tougher, and even, uh, I would say, arithmetically, uh, uh, you have now uh, twice more uh, 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 national parliaments to ratify. Uh, it should, makes it more difficult, uh, by definition, not speaking about other issues. And uh, last point is I'm, I'm grateful uh, for, for this uh, example of uh, how regional cooperation can uh, uh, actually be redefined in new uh, 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 conditions. Uh, originally as a lobby group, advocacy group for countries, and now uh, debating, pooling, and sharing. This is exactly what we have done uh, in Visegrad. Uh, uh, the last Globsec, well, Globsec was mentioned, uh, we presented uh, a study which was done by Visegrad countries uh, 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 and we are also uh, trying to learn from other models from the Nordic model. Uh, so we try to develop uh, something uh, like Stoltenberg report which actually shaped the Nordic cooperation for the Visegrad. Of course, what we found out, there's more limits than opportunities, but still we are trying to use this as a, as a practical format for, uh, uh, for solving issues which are very practical uh, to our uh, defense policies, how to pool and share our capabilities uh, in, in the security area. So it's a very practical tool uh, if all participants are willing to use it uh, use regional cooperation uh, as it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schneider. Mr. Trishni Babic, can I ask you, uh, are you afraid of the proliferation of the regional initiatives? That could be also a jeopardy for the uh, regional cooperation. We heard from uh, Mrs. Tvetkova one, which is successful one, the CEDEM, uh, but there are a lot which are some, in some kind of hibernation but still exist. And it can create a lot of problem uh, to the region. So does the proliferation make a problem to us? Have the concrete example of what could be or what? So some of them are now still uh, working on the paper, some of the initiatives from the former pact, uh, stability pact and things like that. Um, 
Do, do we need a further more initiatives for regional cooperation? Well, I, I, I don't think with, with my experience with all these regional initiatives that uh, 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 there is a need for some new more. I think that it's necessary to do as soon as possible to, to go through some inventory of all of this because it's, because it's more than obvious that they are overlapping. So overlapping, this is waste of time and waste of money. Just concrete uh, example, for the last three weeks there were four cybersecurity roundtables, Sarajevo, Zagreb, in different regional organizations, RCC table, security table organized one also. So this is, but in meantime, our whole region, Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Serbia was in fire. Okay, we need to talk about cybersecurity, that, 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 that's the whole issue. But there are some very life civilian also aspects in our region that in, instead, but we do have a place in this region. So uh, RCC as a continuation of the stability pact, I, we understood that RCC is going to be some kind of the roof of all this regional that will direct them, but still this is not happening. So I think my proposal is the to, to, to best way is to do inventory as soon as possible, uh, say Adriatic Union, CCP, uh, uh, all these uh, regionals, round tables, and especially uh, you have, for example, the, in our RCC, the security table is, I think, under the Bulgarian auspices. In some other initiative in some other countries. So it's very much obvious that they are competing without any reason uh, through us. So that, that's something what uh, 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 I see, as I said, as a necessity to do this, what will help us, uh, mainly in this, as I'm calling this, some kind of the sectorial approach from the region towards the European Union and vice versa. We have, yes, we have time for two short questions, please. Yeah, okay, one short question. My name is Milan Djukic and I am an alumnist of BFP and I have a question for Mrs. Ana Trišić, Mr. Lajčak and Mr. Vučić as Deputy Prime Ministers. And that's a question about Turkey and, uh, and influence of Turkey on Balkans because we have theory that if Turkey stops on EU integration, some kind of compensation will, will be influence on Balkans. And uh, I need, I, I like to have a short answer of you because uh, th that's the theory we talked ab ab about yesterday and day, day before, and we'll talk about it uh, in the day after. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie. We don't have time uh, furthermore, and I have to excuse if I understood properly, Prime Minister, he, he's going to leave or not yet, okay? Uh, so the direct question to you. To Mr. Lajczyk. Okay. Well, Turkey, it's for a pan. there are two tracks, Turkey's EU track and Turkey's activities in this region. Turkey is a candidate country, is a very serious country, is a, a regional player. Turkey is facing its problems with regard to its integration ambitions. Uh, but whatever the length and the outcome of, of, of this process, it has no impact on, on the integration ambitions of this region, and I, I want to be very clear on it. It's not related. What's also important is that Turkey, as I said, is, is a regional player and uh, very visible and active in, in this part of the world, in this region. And here it's important that Turkey promotes the same ideas as the European Union promotes. Because there is, no, there is always an alternative, but there is no better alternative for this region than the European integration. And uh, Turkey and the European Union are certainly not competitors in the Balkans. And whatever instruments, whatever influence Turkey has, we will only appreciate if it will contribute to the success of the European integration of the Western Balkans. Uh, I know that there are a lot, yes. Um, okay. 
question. <laughs> no doubt about, uh, the, about, about the Turkey, how, how Turkey is important, how Turkey is big, and the economy of the Turk, and of course that we need connection, we have the history connection, we, we can easily find work, but uh, towards the European Union integration and towards any assistance in the region, especially concerning Bosnia and Herzegovina, Turkey uh, it's not honest player, not just it's not honest really that wants to help. I think the, through Bosnia and Herzegovina they are uh, promoting mainly themselves like a foreign policy uh, player. I don't think really there is, th 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 there is a need that in the region we need Turkey and have trilateral meetings Turkey, Serbia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, like Turkey is some kind of the player to make a better relations or trilateral meetings Turkey, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think that that, that, that that time that we inside of the region can have our trilateral meetings, so five. So in that context, of course, in economy and Turkey is the NATO countries, they have a good expertise in everything, but Turkey uh, at this moment uh, doesn't bring any harm, at least in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That is a very good start of the, of the conference. I'm uh, sure it's going to be fruitful because I left so many people without possibility to uh, raise the questions, but I have a special treat for you. Um, last week, or in fact this week, uh, we had uh, some new arrivals uh, in Serbia and in Belgrade as the uh, representatives of some of the very important countries, not, also, not only from the European Union, but also from around the world. And uh, today with us we have actually the first public appearance of the uh, newly arrived U.S. ambassador uh, in uh, Serbia, uh, His Excellency Michael Kirby. Uh, and I think that uh, he will be so kind to address us, but before that I would like to uh, introduce Mr. Kirby if that's possible. So he is coming from the State Department. He, uh, he was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Consular Affairs. Before that, Ambassador was the Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador in Moldova. But for 29 years, according to my information, I work within the State Department on different positions. Uh, especially and particularly in terms of the consular affairs um, as a consul general in Frankfurt, but also in some of the countries of the former state, uh, Soviet Union. Um, I would like to use that opportunity to uh, give uh, the possibility for um, Mr. Kirby to give us his insight, the first feeling of the regional cooperation in the region that he is now welcome to, uh, and of course, regarding the cooperation between Serbia and the uh, United States particularly. Uh, I think that they, are, ah, they will give you the possibility to talk like this. So, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, sorry for interrupting the rest of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I have to say in terms of cooperation, it is, uh, for the United States, amazing the, the uh, greeting I had here. It's highly unusual that uh, someone would arrive on Tuesday present credentials on Wednesday, have the opportunity to speak to the Prime Minister uh, on Thursday and the First Deputy Prime Minister as well, and then address this group. Um, I think it says something about uh, what's happened and what's changed here in Serbia that we have this kind of meeting. I know it's only the second one of these meetings, but from what I've seen, it has a rich future. I think the notion of cooperation is one that we welcome greatly in the United States. Um, I've had the opportunity, I, perhaps, to live in a number of the European Union countries, perhaps more than many of you here. I've actually lived in uh, Belgium, France, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and Poland, who are EU members. And joined at various different times. I, of course, have always been a guest. 
uh, a foreigner visiting. But I think that this European union offers a, a variety of things that, that help and I think would help Serbia. I think the notion of the kind of changes that we're talking about, whether they're in uh, military aspects, uh, a number of the countries that joined uh, in the round of 10 with Poland and the Czech Republic and Slovakia saw the route of uh, NATO first and then joining the EU. I think we've seen other examples where that's not necessary. But I also think that the economic prosperity it's brought would be very welcome here in Serbia. Uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity to talk to the uh, Prime Minister about the European future. He assured me that that's definitely where they would like to go. It's a difficult road, we know that. It's not just that the chapters have changed, but as our uh, Czech and Slovak colleagues have mentioned, the EU itself is changing. It's a growing dynamic, and uh, frankly, with the economic difficulties in Europe, uh, there are issues to consolidate there. I'd also like to mention uh, PFP and a whole variety of things that we've done in this part of the world. Uh, it is really interesting to see in the past years how our cooperation with Serbia has grown. Uh, certainly to none of you, uh, the history is unknown, but look at the cooperation the United States and Serbia have now on the military realm. I have in here a whole stack of names of uh, how we've progressed over the years, worked together, worked not necessarily together, but now we have a huge and robust military-to-military -military dialogue that it is, I think, for many of us looking back 20 years, it would have been difficult to understand how the change has come. Look at Serbia now as an exporter of stability rather than Serbia being an importer of, of stability. That is a remarkable change, hugely welcome. Um, I don't want to take too much time because I'm brand new. Uh, I came to listen, to hear, but I'm pleased to be here. The United States feels very welcome here. We look forward to working with our Serbian partners as they move forward to European integration, whatever those various acquis are. Uh, we know that there are some difficult steps with Pristina to be taken in order to get there, but I think that those will happen. Uh, I'm an optimist. I'm new to the region, of course, so I do, I have heard that not optimism, optimism doesn't always run hugely deeply here. Um, but before I conclude, what I would also like to do is thank Sonia Licht, thank uh, Maya Bobic, Sonia Sonjevic, and I'd also like to just make the final comment that yesterday when I came here and took a look around, I have to say that the face of security dialogue here is changing. Uh, I sat next to the Bulgarian Deputy Minister of Defense. I see a lot of women up here. I have to say that certainly with Secretary Clinton, that is very welcome. In the United States, that is welcome. It would be interesting to see how women being engaged in security changes that dynamic. Um, so thank you for the, allowing me to interrupt. And uh, thank you for welcoming me so warmly to Serbia. Thank you very much, especially for noting the fact that there are so many female in the security sector and dealing with the security, which is a, let, let me finish with that. That is a bright future for the cooperation in the region. Yeah. So again, uh, thank you very much for participating in this panel and thank you very much for being here with us. We will have now a coffee break for half an hour, so see you here at noon. <laughs>